first speaker is a hugger. Um, if you see him later, he might give you a hug. Uh, he's from Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, he's, Madison. Uh, he's one of the organizers of an upcoming RubyConf, if you can't get enough of these things, called Madison RubyConf. I'll be one. Um, he was in a race, driving a car fairly fast, and um, smashed into a wall and stopped really quickly. Uh, he's going to tell you about that and um, somehow related to Ruby. Uh, Jim, are you nearby? Okay. Jim Wimsick. So, title, 60 to 0 in 2.5 seconds, which sounds very impressive, but it's really made up numbers. I don't know how long it took me to crash. It was probably more like 70 miles an hour, um, and maybe 80 or 100. Like I said, you guys don't really race stock cars, so you don't know. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> so we, uh, this is uh, a story about an awesome failure in my life. And we're all encouraged to, um, to fail, fail fast. I failed really fast. Um, <laughs> and the, uh, the idea being that you fail, and then you move on, and then you have that experience for next time. So uh, whenever you do fail, it's important to uh, learn the lessons uh, as you're going through your failure, as you get out of uh, the failure and move on to the next, uh, your next endeavor. Um, so, I shared this, this story not in the hopes that you don't actually go out and crash, but that you don't have to. Um, so, go out there and, uh, and take risks and have fun, but make sure that you take away some, some lessons when you do. Talk title is 60 Retrospective. Who here is familiar with a, a re uh, retrospective? Agile retrospective? Awesome. Um, so, Appropriately enough, it's looking back or dealing with uh, past events or situations. Um, so, in actual retrospective, this isn't, because typically you wouldn't wait 14 years before you actually did the retrospective. Um, but this event actually happened in 1997, and uh, it was time to uh, to look back at it as a topic. And uh, unfortunately, we couldn't have the rest of the team here either. And the team in this case would be my wife and, and my dad. Um, did we get live streaming work by chance? Yes. All right, so if that's true, then my wife is probably watching, so she's here, kind of. Um, she's very supportive. She watches all my talks. Uh, and she's great. So typical Agile retrospective. Uh, I talk about what went well, what didn't go well, and what can we do better next time? Um, the, they're sort of very generic questions and intended to uh, foster discussion. Uh, really, a 
allow people to get out what it, uh, what they felt went well to celebrate the successes, what didn't go well to point fingers, not point fingers, but to uh, <coughs> try to correct what could have uh, what could have gone better. So obviously we're looking back at this crash that I was involved in. Uh, 1997, and in fact, uh, a lot of people don't know, that a lot of close personal friends don't know this story. Um, it's not something that necessarily, uh, looking back on the fondness, but it looks something like this. Um, that nearly <laughs> indistinguishable mess used to be a 1981 uh, vehicle saver. Uh, as you can see, it has some modifications. It's a little bit Mad Max. Um, this is a, a personal favorite picture of mine as well, because it's got three of my cars, um, all three of which are now uh, in the scrap heap. But, uh, so this is my stock car. The brown Parisian over there was my daily driver, and the 627 Cadillac first uh, ambulance combo. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, sort of a nice collection of cars. How did we get to that? Uh, when I was growing up, every weekend we spent going to the uh, racetrack since about 1983, um, watching my dad race Pintos. Um, yeah. <laughs> so they, um, they had a four-cylinder stock class, and uh, this was every Friday and Saturday night for about three months, so basically the length of the summer uh, every week. Um, so that's how I acquired a, a taste for, you know, Pintos and Hearses and odd cars. Um, I don't know how I made the jump to Hearses. But, but eventually, I got my driver's license and I said, I gotta get on the track. Um, so I looked for the, the most economical way to do so. Um, this is a 78 uh, Chevy Malibu, I think it was. Uh, and this is 1996, um, this is a parade lap, uh, so that's why there's two people in the car, we need one person to hold the thing. Um, but as you can see, some severe mod modifications to the back roof line, uh, so that we can see, which will make more sense in a moment. And uh, this car probably cost about four to five hundred dollars, all told, to, to get it track right. So it's just like NASCAR. <laughs> interesting things about this picture um, that if you don't know what's going on, you probably don't pick up on. Um, you notice I've turned, perhaps to look at the camera, uh, but then why is the other guy sitting there looking out the back? And what's up with the flag? It looks like it's a really dusty day. Uh, but this is the reason why. Um, we raced in a unique division. This is me right about there, um, and it's a pretty tight-knit group of people, and we did things a little bit differently, it allowed us to get into the track uh, for free, and uh, the reason for that was it was hard to get people to join this division. It looked uh, something like this. This is one of my first races, so I don't get it. So it's, there's a 
there's some risk involved, but uh, it was a lot of fun. In fact, my first race, it was so much fun. I had so much adrenaline going, I could hardly keep my foot on my gas. It was just hopping around so much. Um, also, it's fun several times, and uh, but <laughs> like I said, it's a, it's a lot of fun. It's, uh, it's pretty safe. It looks dangerous, so just dig it. Okay, so this is where the four rules come in about not hitting stuff cars. They actually just leave those cars there. And, uh, the act is not the rest of the races. But basically, it sounds dangerous, right? Um, the the level of danger is much less than, than some of the crazy things that people do. Uh, for example, I just gave this talk in Spain, and I was invited to, to run with the bulls, and I said, you have to be crazy. The, <laughs> I assure you, in my stock car, I never have this face. <laughs> <laughs> and the guy behind me doesn't have this big wad of snot coming out of his nose. <laughs> So it sounds dangerous. Uh, in fact, it's a fairly controlled environment. We have uh, eight known quantities, and there's not really a vetting process, but uh, everybody that comes into uh, that division has to get along, or they're, they're not encouraged to continue. Um, everybody uh, respects each other. It's a pretty tight team. And <clears throat> you're all going the same direction, which is helpful. Um, so in the event of an accident, you're only going 60 miles an hour to zero. You know, if you're driving on a two-lane highway and both people are going 35 miles an hour, that's already more dangerous than what we're doing. There's uh, safety uh, equipment, there's roll cages, helmets, uh, fire retardant jackets, those sorts of things. So it sounds dangerous, but in reality, it's actually uh, fairly controlled. There's paramedics on the scene. Uh, for the rest of the races, not just for the backups. But, uh, so, 1997, this is opening day. Um, you can tell because there's no dents or scratches on the car. Um, but I got a new car I was really excited about, and I was going faster, so I dropped one number. It's all the fast race cars, just have one number. <laughs> and uh, so there's a couple of things that you can uh, you can do when you're racing. I'm going, I'm competing here. So in that first video that we saw, I was, uh, I was driving around the track while everybody else raced. As you can see here, I'm keeping up with the, the first place car, uh, but they're right there. So, of course, we need to go faster. Um, so we need to, we need to be able to beat those other guys. So when you're in amateur stock car racing, there's pretty much two rules of thumb for how to make your car go faster. One is to add stickers. <laughs> <laughs> so we added stickers. Um, it's sort of an odd collection of stickers. We have a Danish uh, film processing chemical company, Refrima. We have Who's More Power Tools, because uh, there was a, some lawsuit with Benford Tools, whatever. And then a little Kelvin sticker like you would put on your you guys wouldn't put it on your car, but some people do. So the other thing that you can do is you can reduce weight. <clears throat> and so having failed to achieve victory just by putting the stickers on the car, we looked at the car and said, where can we, do, where can we reduce rate, uh, weight? <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps that would have been smart. <laughs> no, but clearly here, the issue is that the car is too heavy. So we reduced weight, and uh, we won races, and everything was great. Um, but there's still there's still more weight on that car that can be removed. Um, we were digging through the, the engine compartment, fixing something, and I saw, oh, there's cruise control on this car. You don't need cruise control for a stock car. <clears throat> so 
let's take it off. Um, and that removed approximately, again, a lot of numbers you guys don't know, but they removed about a pound and a half of, uh, of weight from the car. Clearly, there was no better place to reduce weight on that car <laughs> than to take off that one and a half pound part. Uh, and so we did a, a silly thing. We took off that, that cruise control part and uh, went out and we went racing. This is actually not from the night of the crash, but this will give you an idea of what it looks like from inside the car. Um, that is a, a fellow competitor I started in the second row. Uh, so I get in the car. And I'm racing around the track, and something's wrong. I can feel it. Uh, it doesn't feel like it normally does. When I put the gas down to the floor, uh, it stops short of uh, going full rock. So I come into this corner, and I jam the gas down. And what happens is it goes all the way to the floor. I get about halfway down the straightaway, where I would normally lift off the accelerator, and my foot came, but the pedal didn't. So I'm racing backwards uh, down this straightaway at full throttle with no way to stop. The only thing I could think to do is to try and turn the corner. It seems logical. Um, and unfortunately, I didn't make the turn. The car actually spun around and embedded itself into the end of the concrete wall is about six inches thick, and the, the track is actually designed for cars to go the other way. They didn't think people are going to be driving backwards around this, we need to make sure it's safe for them too. <laughs> but as you can see, um, I'm okay. In fact, I tried to get out of the car, and the paramedics rush over it because I thankfully crashed right next to them. <laughs> they said, sit down, settle down. Um, are you hurt? I said, no, I'm fine. They said, well, hold on. Um, it looks like you cut your knee. And uh, I had no idea at the time. I looked down, oh, sure enough, there's blood on my knee. Excellent. Um, <laughs> at this point, though, adrenaline, whatever, I'm not feeling any pain. Everything's fine. Um, and then they say, uh, it looks like you might have injured your knee pretty badly. Okay, well, let's get me out of here then. And uh, they proceeded to uh, cut through the roll cage and the outside of the car with uh, the jaws of life, which when I gave this talk in Madrid was very hard to explain. <laughs> you know, the jaws of life. Uh, <laughs> so they're cutting through the roll cage, which is right next to my leg. I have tried to be helpful. I was like, oh, I'll just move my knee. Paramedics jump out of their skin because my knee is very badly injured. None of which is, of course, I can do. So <clears throat> we go through it. I'm feeling fine. In fact, my brother John here, I talked to him and was like, oh yeah, I'm going to I'm gonna go to work tomorrow. I gotta be to work at 7 a.m. <laughs> and this happened about uh, midnight, 11:30 on a Friday night. Um, but Saturday, 7 a.m. was time that I had to go to work, so I bet you 50 bucks on my network tomorrow. So he took that bet. <laughs> As most people probably would. Uh, they took me to the hospital, and I'm joking with the doctors, and my knee starts going back and forth, and uh, all of a sudden it released, and I realized that he had just sawed off a piece of skin. <clears throat> but I'm joking with the doctor. I said, Ever feel like you just lost a little piece of yourself? <laughs> Again, I was fine. There was uh, anesthetic, there was adrenaline, and uh, things were, were going pretty well. So we went to work the next day, and I showed up at about 6.45, my usual time, and my boss was there. He was relieved I was okay. He had some light-duty work that I could do. Um, we did some hand assembling of books, and I could sit at a table while the table turned. It was pretty decent. Um, then my girlfriend showed up. 
now my wife, Jennifer. Um, and I had another crash. Because <laughs> apparently, uh, throughout this whole ordeal, my dad had asked, do you want me to call Jen and let her know what happened? <laughs> <laughs> Not really. <laughs> it's Friday, it's like midnight. Uh, she's probably sleeping. You know, don't bother calling her. But then I didn't call her, even though we worked at the same place and I knew she'd gone away. I didn't call her. So she walked into work and sees me with my leg up, holding the books. Not happy. <clears throat> so, we uh, spend the entire 12 hours at work, and have an angry girlfriend, but I'm pretty much okay. Uh, yeah, I'm starting to, to feel the pain, but I've got painkillers, and um, so things are, are going well. But then, I get home, and my dad had brought the car back from the racetrack, and uh, had had basically all day to think about the accident and look at the car and uh, so I walk up in the driveway and I see this. This is my sock car, or a small part of it. Um, this is the driver's seat, which is cut off about halfway uh, so that we can turn around and see on the back of the car. Um, and I see this, which you've already seen. but. <clears throat> I'm like, wow, no, that looks bad. And then my dad points out, you see this blue bar that looks like a little uh, A-frame? Imagine if you had a passenger in that car. Oh, then I had another crash. So if I had had a passenger in my car, that would have been approximately in their face, um, which sounds like a very bad thing for the passenger. Then we looked at the uh, front of the car and realized I crashed on the right-hand side of this car. If I would have spun a little bit more and spun on the uh, and crashed into the left-hand side of the car, uh, things would have gotten very bad very quickly. Um, and this was a very sobering moment uh, for me and for my dad. He felt responsible for the, the maintenance and the, the changes of the car. Um, yes, yeah, as, as I prepare for this talk, you know, it's bringing all of this this stuff back, uh, and it's it's some scary shit, honestly. Um, so, but this talk was about a retrospective. So now that we've heard about uh, the incident, let's go through the questions. What went well? <laughs> went faster than we ever have before. Maybe 70 miles an hour. The safety equipment worked. And the controlled environment worked as planned. The paramedics were there. They got me out of the car. Got to the, the uh, hospital. Everything was great. So what didn't go well? I didn't win the race. Uh, I crashed hard. This, the equipment that was there to uh, keep me safe nearly killed me because of a poor design. And I had an angry girlfriend. As I look at these, uh, as I looked back at these though, I saw some, some more generic lessons that could be learned. Um, so what can we do better next time? Don't race the car unless we've practiced. Have someone else review the, uh, the roll cage design. Because it turns out that we had placed a bar uh, in such a way that if you had a, a strong forward impact, it would rip off of the uprights and into the driver's compartment, which is never a good idea. Um, examine the car for sharp edges. I wound up cutting my knee and that uh, happened. As I hit the car, I actually slid in my seatbelt, and I sliced my knee open on a uh, upright or uh, a mounting plate for the steering wheel. After that, they uh, they installed a gym pad on all of the cars, which is basically a piece of fire that was wrapped around the sharp object, so that if you hit it, you just shatter your knee instead of cutting your, your skin. Open. 
And uh, communicate with my girlfriend when I crash, even if I don't think it's a big deal. <laughs> but those more general lessons uh, that I see, don't implement without practice. That actually sounds pretty strong. Have someone else review the design. We do this in uh, either uh, pair programming, doing code reviews, making code open source. <coughs> Look for sharp points and take care of them. These are failing tests, uh, broken windows, uh, those kinds of things. And communicate to avoid uh, surprising the other people in the project. Uh, would have saved me a lot of, of uh, explaining. So, capture. So again, I said test, design reviews, um, Get feedback, get interacts. Uh, there's a wealth of information if you happen to be building a product. Uh, there is a wealth of information available at the hashtag measure um, to, on how to get more information. Um, I gave this talk in, uh, in Spain and I was the, the closing keynote, so I was able to listen to everybody else's talk and incorporate them into my talk. Uh, and it actually worked out pretty well. Uh, Sam Fuchs is one of the, the authors of Travis CI. Um, but it's hard to recover from failures if you don't really know what's going on. And in this case, I didn't really know that taking off that one and a half pound part that was related to the accelerator was going to make it stick. <coughs> Analyze the situation um, for us. Everything was great. So we took the time after the fact to really look at the car and realize how dangerous, the, the, how, how much peril we had actually uh, wound up putting me into. Um, so when you try something new, you're going to be uncomfortable. Uh, we took off that part and I was uncomfortable for about four weeks. Uh, change. So you gathered all this information. Analyze. So you need to affect change. Uh, one of my coworkers, when I was working at Hash Rocket, uh, said, "Make this the kind of place that you want to work." Um, which I, I took hard. Do you want to work in a place where people don't take out the trash? No, of course not. So I started taking out the trash. Um, didn't matter that I was doing it more than anybody else. I wanted to work in a place where people took out the trash. Um, so, looking back, uh, dealing with uh, this past event made me realize that I had learned some lessons. Uh, but at the same time, I don't want to tell people not to take risks. Just try to control your environment a little bit. Make sure that you have uh, help on hand. Make sure that you do your due diligence. But go out, play, break something, have fun. Whether you're breaking democracy in Spain with the, the open the internet party, <coughs> help organize people around an idea. Go bungee jumping, skydiving, put yourself up there, take a risk, and do something that sounds dangerous. In our community, we have a couple of people that tend to do this on a regular basis. <coughs> Not wearing the boxers, but actually decide that you're going to tame uh, what the multiple versions of Ruby from. <laughs> right? That's a big deal. That's a big deal, too. <laughs> Maybe illustrate a quirky book that teaches folks about programming using bacon, bacon and facts. <laughs> bacon and foxes. <laughs> or faxes. Um, I mean, who really would have thought of this and said, that's a great idea, everybody's going to love this? Not me, but everybody does, and we're a better